Hey, what's up, Spice Heads? Welcome back. Thank you guys so much for joining us for another great video meetup today sponsored by InfoSec. Today, we're going to be talking all about your security awareness training and what are some principles outside of IT that you should be using to incorporate that to make sure your users are retaining that knowledge, using that knowledge, and that it's just sticking in those brains of theirs and, and, and uh, helping to protect your company and your data. For more on this, we have a great panel of experts for you all today, including uh, folks from InfoSec, uh, as well as a couple of security awareness trainers who are going to be telling us about their experience as well. So without further ado, let's go ahead and kick things off with a round of introductions. Coming to us first from InfoSec, uh, everyone, please welcome Ms. Lisa Plagmeyer. Lisa, welcome to the show today. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Thanks for having me. Hi, I'm Lisa Plagmeyer. I'm the Chief Evangelist at InfoSec. We're a, a security education provider. I also teach our Certified Security Awareness Practitioner class. Um, formerly, I ran a training and awareness program for a technology company with about 9,000 employees in 23 countries and a half a billion consumer records to protect. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. We are looking forward to hearing from you, Lisa. Our next panelist is Mr. Joe Pokrovsky. Joe, welcome. How's it going? Great, thanks. Good to be here. Yeah, so Joe Pokrovsky, most uh, recently I was the Director of Security Education and Awareness for J.P. Morgan Chase, so a fairly large program encompassing uh, you know, over a quarter million people globally. And I also run a small training education and awareness consultancy called Learning at the Speed of Need. Very cool. All right, well, we are looking forward to hearing from you as well. Last but not least, from also right here in Austin, in fact, very, very nearby, uh, is Ms. Kristen Abraham. Kristen, how's it going today? Good, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm Kristen, uh, just most, most recently working for GM, running the global security awareness program there. So um, my focus more on the awareness bit, so more uh, communications um, and employee comms around information security and cybersecurity. All right, very cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're looking forward to talking with all of you. Before we begin, a couple of things that I did want to chat about. Um, if you guys do have questions for our panel today, make sure to get those into the Q&A widget. We'll be taking those questions later on in the show. Uh, also, make sure to check out all of the downloadable resources that InfoSec has provided to us today in that resource list. Also, uh, you guys may notice the chat widget that is available. Um, always love to see all of our favorite IT pros coming into uh, the session and, and get to catch up with everybody. Just as a reminder, um, while it's totally okay to go off topic, we just wanna make sure that everyone's having a positive and professional experience on it. So just uh, make sure that you're following our community guidelines. Um, and uh, we'd love to see what y'all think about the show. Um, and as a special thank you for all y'all joining us today, uh, is it two of y'all are going to be winning? Two of you guys are going to be winning FLIR TG165 spot thermal cameras. So um, that's pretty exciting. You'll have to let me know what you guys do with it. Uh, make sure to stick around till the end of the show. We will be announcing the winners of those prizes as well as taking your questions. All right. Well, let's go ahead and dive right into it. So one of the topics that we're here today to talk about, obviously, how IT organizations should be approaching um, their security awareness training. Now, when it comes to sales and marketing, this is not necessarily, those are not two, um, you know, uh, areas of business that a lot of IT pros have a lot of experience in. And in fact, I would imagine the Venn diagram is largely two different circles, maybe like a sliver of intersection. Uh, Lisa, uh, let's talk with you first. You know, are there things from, you know, traditional sales and marketing strategies and tactics uh, that IT organizations should be looking to for guidance on how to approach their security awareness training. Sure, so I kind of have a biased opinion because um, that was my background. My The first CISO that hired me recruited me from the marketing organization um, because he wanted to kind of shake up the way that we did training and awareness. So um, I came with that skill set and of course, naturally, you know, that was my inclination was to apply it to how we do training and awareness. And one of the things I noticed in working with um, practitioners at other companies was I think um, there's a lot of great people in, in security, um, a lot of folks with, you know, law enforcement or, or a service background, federal law enforcement or local or military, a lot of do-gooders, right? We want to see the right thing happen. And we definitely have this sense of, of mission. But I think we suffer a little bit from what I call the curse of passion. 
So just like the curse of knowledge where you assume the, the, the audience for what you're saying has the same base level of knowledge that you do and then your message doesn't resonate, I think sometimes we assume that people care about this. We all feel very passionate about this stuff, right? And um, we kind of assume that maybe our listeners feel as passionate as we do or maybe they should at least feel as passionate as we do. And that's not always the case. And so we often can miss the opportunity to even just get people's attention from the outset. There was a widely publicized study a couple of years ago that claimed that um, the human attention span was now shorter than a goldfish, like seven seconds or something like that. And advertising agencies started selling seven second ad spots. And what we found out, you know, a year or two later now is that that's not actually true. You know, people binge watch things on Netflix, so we couldn't do that if we were goldfish. Um, there's the, the reality is that there's so much media. There's so many things vying for our attention, right? We've got whatever's happening on our on our cell phone, we've got our Facebook feed or our LinkedIn feed or work email, personal email, all this stuff hitting us at once. There's so much media um, that the reality is that we're, we're filtering ruthlessly. We are being extremely, we only give things a few seconds of our attention before we decide, yes, this is actually worthy of my full attention or it's not. And so I think we have to focus on those few seconds that we get with people, right? If we don't get their attention, then they're never going to engage with the rest of the message and we, we lose our, our leverage to try and teach them anything. Kristen, what are your thoughts? How do you feel like we should be uh, pulling in lessons from the sales and marketing uh, best practices into security awareness training? Um, yeah, it's such a good question and it's building on what Lisa was saying too. Um, if you're just writing articles and just putting kind of text out there, I don't think anyone's really going to get your your message. You're not going to kind of get across to people. So this whole sales and marketing piece comes in where you have to use kind of um, unique imagery and taglines and, you know, kind of one shot slides or something that'll really grab the person's attention. Like Lisa says, where you have seconds to do that. Uh, and get more and and be sure you're not you know doing the tick box because you put an article on your intranet and so you've made your employees aware um, that really it, it's a lot of kind of creative work to get the messages out to your employees. And Joe, uh, what are your what do you feel like are the major takeaways from sales and marketing that we all should be applying to our training? Yeah, look, for me, uh, you know, I've been getting a much greater appreciation working with people like Lisa and others that have a sales, marketing, communications background. Uh, so for me, it, it's everything everybody just said. And, and I, the phrase I use to remind myself about this is that we do consume all of this information in many different ways. So we have to keep that in the back of our mind, mind right? It's not a one size fits all. Some of us, are, you know, visually uh, will be, be appealed to through visual means versus, you know, audio or, or things that I want to read. So, um, I think in the world of uh, uh, sales and marketing, we think in terms of a campaign mindset. And I really think we need to bring that into the realm of education, security, awareness as well. So, you know, we have to do these things intentionally. And if we think about them as campaigns and, and kind of build our materials and, and our deployment channels and our follow up and our measurements off of that, I think we have a you know, much, much better uh, chance of success. All right, cool. Uh, this next question, Joe, will stay with you. Um, so you guys have been doing security awareness training for quite some time. As we all know, there's what seems like it's going to work in our heads and what has actually you know, proven to be effective in practice. What do you guys feel like are the things that we should know about? Maybe some of the things that are, are newer on the scene that can help capture people's attention. And in specific, what's actually working and what's not? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think first off, you know, if you just think about the last three, four, five years, right? Uh, there's a much greater appreciation for the need for security awareness, right? A few years back, maybe four or five years ago, right? We were we were concerned about the length of passwords and, and phishing was all that anybody talked about. But now, you know, almost a day doesn't go by where we're not looking, you know, seeing on the news or reading the papers that, about, uh, you know, all these privacy breaches. And, and so what happens now is, right, this is top of mind almost at every company represented on this call today and beyond, right? So, it's sort of an expectation from our customers that we're secure. And so I think that the good news is, right, there's a lot of attention in this space, uh, but it's much, much more than just passwords and phishing now, right? We, we have to pay attention in, you know, data loss prevention and uh, uh, secure coding and, you know, uh, identity access management. And, you know, so it kind of crosses the, the, the board in that respect. And secondly, though, I think what's uh, growing in importance these days is, is now that we've been around, that we've been doing a security awareness for a few years, right, leadership is now has an expectation they want to understand 
Does it pay off? Is there a result? We're going to need better, more robust metrics and measures to sort of justify that there is a return on the investment of our people time and, and monies, or at least a return on the expectation that people you know, would have from a program that we're running. All right. Lisa, let's hear from me next. What do you feel like or what you've seen work best and what doesn't? Yeah, I think there's definitely more of an emphasis on, on return on investment. Like Joe said, measuring ROI has become um, even more important. And I think that um, everybody likes fishing programs because it's really easy to see results, right? You actually get metrics. But then being able to tie those, tying those mock fishing results to what happens in the real world. Right, like what do people do when they get a when they get a real fish? Trying to have that apples to apples comparison and and prove that stuff is working. Um, there's a lot more. I see a lot more emphasis on integrating all the different tooling. Right, so um, you know, assigning training modules based on um, you know alerts that you're getting from endpoint protection and things like that. Um, being a part of your incident response team and then being able to train to those actual real world things that happen in your in your environment. Um, being able to track your IT tickets uh, better, right? So I, one of the things I worked on in my last uh, position was getting more granular about, um, you know, how we classify different IT tickets. If we've re, re um, imaged a laptop due to a malware infection, if we had a smash and grab a lost laptop, things like that, um, being able to get really granular with those and, and make, tra you know, do a awareness campaigns or make training assignments, short, very digestible little five minute training assignments t to folks on the same day maybe that we got an alert from their endpoint. That training is um, usually more welcome and gets taken more quickly. Um, I used to do training assignments based on DLP alerts. Very short training assignments did not make a mandatory, but 100% of the people took them because we could tie them back to something that happened like, you know, in the moment for them and, and was specific to them. And so people, I think, found that more helpful um, and not it wasn't seen as a punitive thing. It was like, hey, we got this alert while we're looking at it to make, you know, to make sure that it's a that it's not a false positive. You might want to look at those, you know, two, three, four minute training module, you know, on this particular topic to help you out. So um, a lot more of that integration with other tools and technology in your security organization and um, a lot more emphasis on trying to measure the return on investment for sure. Kristen, uh, anything, uh, anything from you as far as what you have found works best? Well, I think one of the things, one of the positive things we're seeing is that companies are wanting to do more advanced training now because most employees um, if, if your program's been in place for a few years, most employees kind of get the basics. Um, and so you're able to go into some more um, advanced topics, especially with certain target groups. And I think too, once your program has been running for a while, the people who run it essentially become known as the internal experts. Um, and you start to get questions and comments and things that actually help you customize your training going forward or realize where maybe um, I used to get people that would just email me personally and forward me something and go, Hey, is this a fish? Like, what should I do with this? And which is fine. Cause, but then you realize, okay, maybe we're not being really clear enough about what people need to do when they do suspect it's a fish because really they shouldn't be emailing me. Um, but better to email me than other people probably. But um, I, I think there's an opportunity to do more, like better and more advanced training as your program is there um, and to kind of establish yourself as, as the internal expert on the topic, which is, which is nice. Okay. Great. Um, now, another topic to discuss is one of the best practices that I've heard time and time again is you can't just have one training, one size fits all. Um, you do need to be able to make it more relevant and more personal. Um, Joe, what is, you know, in your experience, what ways have you been able to make tr uh, training relevant to specific types of employees and maybe provide yeah. some examples? Yeah, it's a good one, Justin. So it, it, it sort of ties back to where we started, right, with some of the marketing discussion. So for me, at least, it's, uh, it's, it's all about uh, what I would call context, right? How do you make it relevant to me? How do you make it relevant to, uh, to a different user? And we're, you know, we're all, we all work in places that are comprised of a lot of different members and several different audiences at least. So one of the best things we can do is simply to make it personal, right? And, and what we've seen, you know, many of us that have run these programs for a few years is help me make it personal, help me protect 
my family, my kids, my, you know, people that I know at home. And I'm much more likely to probably bring that uh, behavior back into the workplace. Look, you got to recognize that, you know, if, if the company asks me to do something, there is always a percentage, probably 10 percent at the top of that list that will do anything the company asks them to do. Right. Then there's at the other end of the spectrum, maybe the bottom 10 percent. They're never going to do anything you ask them to do, maybe just because you asked them to do it. So we're sort of targeting that, you know, that big 80 percent swath in the middle and and finding a way to make that appealing to them, I think, is the key. These days, particularly as everybody rushes to bring agile environments and everything into the workplace, that's happening in the realm of education and awareness too, right? Personas are all the rage. And so I would just adapt that, right? I would bring that in. Um, we called it uh, choose your own adventure. There's a lot of different words for it. But uh, a quick example, last year's annual uh, compliance training module, we, we implemented that technique. When you logged in, when you registered to take the course, you could pick a persona, an avatar, uh, that was close to a job that you might have done at our bank. And then all we had to do was reset the context. The, the concepts, as Kristen said, the things that we're teaching are basically the same, but we could rephrase the scenarios and the questions you might be asked and have to answer in the context of that role. And so we got some of the uh, highest uh, uh, positive feedback scores that we've had ever on any of the training by allowing that. In fact, it was so well received that we've now implemented that for our new hire training because Kristen makes a good point, right? If you've done this for a few years at a firm, you kind of know this stuff, but all of us have people that are coming in fresh that may not know it. So we've kind of taken that route to say, here's a here's a, a way to make it contextually relevant for the job that you do. And we find that uh, that's increased our engagement substantially. All right, very cool. Um... Kristen, let's go to you next. You know, what, what experience have you had tailoring your content to specific audiences? Um, well, and, and, and kind of uh, on the same vein as Joe. So I think every, most companies are going to end up having required training um, from a compliance perspective that everybody has to take. So in that instance, though, even that you can customize a bit. We did that where you would indicate what's your job function. Do you ever do this kind of activity, yes or no? And then based on how you answered that question, it would customize. And you're not, so from the training aspect, you're not reinventing it. You're, you're creating, you know, 10 modules. And then dep depending on who the person is taking them, somebody might have to go through all 10 because they're relevant to their role. Someone else may only have to do five because they're just never going to be in some of these situations. Um, so if you can customize kind of that required bit, um, and then like to what Lisa said, if, if you can deliver immediate response training, so if you are running a phishing simulation program and somebody clicks and they shouldn't, they get an instant pop-up box of here's maybe what you should have noticed, here's what you should do, DLP, um, you know, you're not allowed to copy a file, so you get an instant communication or email that tells you why and if you have any questions contact x and i think all of these things are things that you have the luxury of doing kind of once your program is underway right i think if your program is brand new um it's going to be hard to do all this stuff right off the bat but um eventually you'll be able to do these things and it makes it a little more relevant for your employees and hopefully um more meaningful and ends up sticking with them Mm -hmm. uh, and Lisa, any, you know, any experience that you can share as far as uh, being able to tailor your, your content? Yeah, I think one of the mantras we had was, uh, we're not going to give you training you don't need. <laughs> um, so we had some, uh, in my last position as a practitioner, we had some highly technical people. And so they were ready for uh, concepts and information that was a little bit more advanced and more appropriate for their, for their jobs. I mean, the obvious example is probably OWASP top 10 training for software developers, right? Um, but in general, I think Joe touched on it as well, having um, content that's available for people's different learning styles. Some people might be verbal, some people might be oral, some people just how they learn and how they choose to, to, to digest information. Um, you know, some people could like a traditional computer based training module, right? Some people would rather watch an animation or something gamified or live action, something funny, something serious. Um, I think that's where the industry is going to go as a as a whole is getting better at using data to figure out 
what it is people want to engage with and, and letting people choose and, and then, you know, just getting smarter about what kind of training we serve up to those folks. So if you look at it, um, things like Netflix and Amazon Prime and Hulu and all those things, um, they're constantly suggesting, you know, if you like this, you might like that. And, the, and, and they've got all those nifty algorithms ha- helping you figure out, you know, the, something that you might find engaging. And I think eventually that's where we need to go as an industry as, as well. Um, give people those choices of how they want to consume and then, and then um, try to, you know, pull them through that traditional sales and marketing funnel, get them more engaged in, in the, on security topics um, in ways that appeal to, to them, making it more personalized and more customized. Okay, cool. But Lisa, I, I do have a question for you. So obviously, you know, the more customized and more tailored, the better. But that is more time on the author's part and the trainer's part. How do you go about making the training specific for users without it being too time consuming? I, I think um, there's vendors in the space that are getting better at doing that, right, to make that easier for the person who's running the, the program. Um, I think there's probably the, the thing that I've um, run into the most with um, – clients is uh, people that are kind of letting perfection be the enemy of good, right? So they've, they want customized content. They, they have things that are very specific about their organizations and about their environments, and they, and they want to put customized content out there. But it's incredibly, incredibly time-consuming to do that. Um, they might kind of get bogged down in their corporate bureaucracy. And there's so much good content out there on the market today. You know, it's not all the one-hour um, hacker and a hoodie stuff that we were all stuck with 10 years ago. So there, and there are also ways that you can, you know, quick and easy tools you can use to, to make your own modules. Um, there's vendors in the space that allow you to have ways to customize a module just enough to make it work for you, right? Like at the beginning or at the very end of the module, what have you, or make your own modules. Um, there's so many tools out there that make it easy, but I would, um, I would say to people that there's so much good stuff out there even if it isn't 100% perfect for your environment, um, I think it's better to get started than it is to wait until until you've got content that's absolutely perfect for your organization or teaches every every last detail. And don't forget that um, training modules are just one piece. It's just one tool in your tool belt, right? So if you're trying to get across um, some details that are maybe specific to your organization, you can, you know, do a poster, do a article in an email newsletter. Do, there's other ways. You don't have to say everything in every tactic, right? It's just about getting people's attention and kind of sprinkling all this good, all this goodness throughout all the different things that you're doing, whether it's training or it's awareness activities, things like that. But, um, you know, the longer we take to kind of crank up a decent program you know meanwhile the bad guys are still doing their thing so my bias is always going to be to like get something out there and and um act quickly and and don't be afraid to just get started Mm -hmm. perfection is the enemy of good yep Uh, (laughs) Kristen, what about you you know what's your guidance on how to balance uh you know segmentation and tailoring with just you know getting something out to market so to speak um well i think to Lisa's point, that there there is so much good stuff out there that I mean that you don't want to you know just flat out plagiarize. But um, there's so many good ideas and so many things and so many tools. But then on the flip side as well, when we talk about um, you know trying to make it not super time consuming for us as the creators, I think it's equally important to keep in mind that you don't want to make it too time consuming for the people consuming it. Um, so whenever you can, especially on some of your um, kind of key messages that you're repeating all the time, because if you're in this space, you know that there are certain things that you're just kind of, you know, beating over and over again because they're just not going away. Strong passwords and clicking on things in phishing. I mean, those things are just not going away. Um, so if you can find just really quick, like you can do a slide on a closed caption television, or you can put a really short PowerPoint together to explain one of those concepts um, that leaders can plug in at the start of one of their PowerPoint decks that they're presenting to their folks to bring it in as a point of education and discussion. And again, not, you know, having to sit down and do an hour long course, but if you can just glance a slide on a television screen and it resonates with you, or if a leader can spend four or five minutes on a few slides at the start of a presentation, um, 
it's all it's all adding up, right? And your your folks are getting smarter all the time when you're doing that. All right, and Joe, uh, what what's your advice on how to balance customization with just time constraints? Well, I think uh, I think Lisa and, uh, and Kristen nailed it. I'm a, I'm a big believer in buying or renting where you know versus me building it wherever I can and whenever budgets allow. Um, and then yeah, the marketplace is just chock full of great stuff. And one of the things that's really happened over the last few years is there is there are so many players and there is such good content. Ten years ago, we might have been talking about one or two security providers that we could go to. Now there's a plethora of them, uh, which has taken its natural course. And this stuff is much, much more affordable, right, than it was before. So we have resources that go from low or no cost, right, up to, you know, sizable budget. So I would definitely, you know, don't shut the door on that. It, it uh it makes sense. And I think Kristen touched on a good point, too, you know, at recognizing that some of our users know this stuff and offering them ways to opt out or to prove their competency and not not requiring them to take. That saves a lot of uh, that saves a lot of time and effort on their part, too. And your program would be much better received if you're not constantly hitting the same people with the same messaging right? year after year after year. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, let's talk next about biggest training mistakes. Um, Lisa. What, in your experience, has been some of the most common or most egregious mistakes you see organizations making? So I think the place where we miss an opportunity the most that, that I see is um, kind of making the entire program mandatory. So I, I used to do this, and I know a lot of people do this. They kind of run two par parallel programs, right? So you kind of have this, this one little small program running that's, that's purely for compliance, right? And maybe it's, maybe it's you know quarterly or annually or according to your compliance regulations, right? And you have your spreadsheet that's ready for the auditors at any given time and, and, and that's all tied up with a bow. But I think if you're really trying to change the culture and you're really trying to get engagement, then that's the kind of stuff you can't make mandatory, right? And that's, that's um, the bulk of your awareness materials. Um, you know, the word engagement gets thrown around a lot these days, but it has to actually mean that you're making people want something, right? That you're drawing them in um, and they're drawn to what it is, you know, they're buying what it is you're selling, right? Um, if you take something like we talk about all this good content that's out there, if you take something like a series of funny videos, for example, like live action or something, and you make those mandatory, you know, you turn them into LMS modules, um, suddenly they're not funny anymore, right? You can't, you can't kind of force that culture change, you have to cultivate it, you have to grow it, you're sort of planting seeds, um, not shoving stuff, you know, at people or making it too heavy handed. So, um, so I think there's kind of no excuse anymore for doing stuff that's, that's boring, because there's a lot of affordable, entertaining stuff out there. And um, I think, uh, I think gone are the days when we do really heavy handed stuff, especially if we're trying to get people in, in to engage. Um, using fear as a motivator is is um, is not the way to get people to engage on security. Right. Joe, what are your thoughts? You know, what do you feel like are things that people should stop doing <laughs> when it comes to their training? Well, look, it really it, uh, it, it, piggybacking off what Lisa said. You know, I, again. We use the word program a lot, a security awareness program, and a program is not an event, right? The annual compliance training, that's an event. Your program can be a collection of events, a collection of articles, a collection of videos. So just keeping that in mind, right? Your program, you got 12 months in a year to run your program. You might have a few weeks or a month to run your events. Um, and I think too often we'll lose sight of that and get bogged down in you know spending you know a quarter of a year building the annual compliance module that's not your program and then uh the other uh challenge i guess for us certainly a mistake I i've done it uh i've seen others do it and then you have to work your way back out of it is to, is you know sometimes because of your time frames the you know the, the workload you have the other things that you're doing you know you sort of get your requirement the boss tells you what they want you to do the it department sh shares you know where they need to go cyber tells you what the biggest threats are we know the answers we build the content we push it out there and fingers crossed you know people will go consume it and we can't leave the users out of this so you know really useful to have a user feedback loop taking in you know their their opinion because they're going to tell you whether they want to read it or watch it or it's funny or it's not funny but if you don't have the user feedback loop you know you're barking up the wrong tree right uh, and Kristen, any uh, any of your thoughts as far as what are the biggest mistakes people should avoid? Um, I think keeping on the same track, it's just 
it's, it's important to focus on the push versus the pull. Um, and if everything you're doing is push, like mandatory this and mandatory, and you're just pushing articles and stuff, and you're not creating um, any content or programs or anything that that people are just going to on their own. So if you have, um, like we've, we've had an internal, an intranet site that's all, everything information security, um, policies, you know, PowerPoint slides, every, everything having to do with security. And you have to make, you know, let people know it's there, but then make the content engaging so that people go there. So you're not just pushing that stuff on them all the time. Um, but that people start to learn where the tools are and what the tools are and they go and use them themselves when they're not entirely sure or when they want to learn more or they want to share more information with their team. So I think just being aware of that push versus pull dynamic is important. Mm -hmm. okay. Kristen, let's stay with you on this next question, but you know, for, um, concerning about whether or not our programs are compliant as well as effective, are, are, would you say that that's mutually exclusive or is there a way to, to bridge the two? Um, well, I mean, I think you probably have to somehow bridge the two, but I, 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 I always go to, I had a CISO who would use this as an example um, to show that compliant and effective are not the same thing. Um, so he would always talk about, you know, and with broad audience that um, a compliant password is not necessarily an effective password. Um, and we had a, an all hands IT meeting um, where we did um, a couple, like did some slides of like the top 10 worst passwords that we would find when we would do penetration testing. Um, and there were lots of people using them. Um, so, you know, for instance, at General Motors, if you do capital G, capital M, General Motors 19, technically that's a compliant password because you've done uppercase, lowercase letters, numbers, but it's an awful password and it's weak and you're <laughs> going to be hacked in less than a second. So um, I, th I think they, they don't mean the same thing and you have to kind of keep in mind um, the difference between the two, and while you do need to be compliant, I think it's a lot more important uh, to be effective. All right. Let's go next to um, Lisa. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on compliance versus effectiveness? I I agree with Kristen. I think it, it's it's a lot more important to be effective than compliant. I think the bad guys don't care if you're compliant, right? <laughs> um, they just, they just don't. We're all worried about this and, and they could care less. Um, it's not going to change what they're doing. So I used to kind of have fun with the auditors because I would, it would frustrate me so much that they were just looking at, you know, they just wanted that spreadsheet, right? That said that I had, you know, 99.9% .9 of my people take training or whatever it was. Um, and I'd show up with all these other, all this other data on, but here's how many people watch these videos and here's how many people played this game show and here's how many people read these articles and da 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 da, right? I, I used to run campaigns that were like marketing campaigns, so I'd have all these different touch points that people could potentially have, right? Analytics from my employee portal, whatever it happened to be. And, um, and I would just kind of throw that at them as part of the audit process just for the heck of it. And of course they could care less. <laughs> so, so I think, um, you know, do what you have to do for the auditor, make sure you're, you know, you've, you've got whatever it is in your industry, if it's your, your customer con contracts, whatever it is that, that, that you need to comply with, by all means do that. That's, but that's just kind of table stakes. The real fun happens when you're actually, um, getting to change the culture and, and having employees that want to engage on security and are asking questions and, and approaching your security team for help on different things. And that's what you really want. Okay. Joe, any thoughts from you as far as compliance versus effectiveness? Uh, in the interest of time, I couldn't say it any better than was just said, right? So <laughs> compliant checks the box, the rest of the program's about effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then one last question before we go to uh, our questions from the audience is, how do we know if it's working or not, Joe? So you've delivered this training. We didn't get hacked in the last three weeks. Was it a success? Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, look, I, that's my background is in training and education. And and uh, this, in my opinion, needs to be the first question asked, right? <laughs> and answer at any time we're tasked with training, education, security awareness, kind of doesn't matter. It's a contrary to popular belief, you know, training isn't the answer to everything. Um, uh, 
so I mean, there's there's some there's some con consulting that has to go on. There's some questions that need to be asked around, you know, what is the behavior we're trying to change, and can we measure that today? Right. So if we can't measure it today, we can't measure that we change to tomorrow. That's an important discussion to have at the beginning of any any part of your campaign. Um, uh, are there other things in the environment that might be influencing the behavior? So I, I, I can I can rattle on, but I'll just give you a quick example. Right, early on in my security awareness program, we got the, you know, came down from on high, phishing click rates are too high. Do something about it. So we constructed, of course, as one would, you know, the phishing campaign. We went about our awareness. We spent several months teaching, raising, you know, the bar, raising the knowledge. And came that summer, we ran the next phishing test off the back of that training and the click rates had skyrocketed. So not the result we wanted. Was the training and the campaign bad? Well, upon further analysis, what happens at the bank I'm at every summer is a plethora of interns show up. The summer <laughs> intern program good. We had failed to take that into account, so there was an, another environmental factor causing that. So we have, you have to have all of that sussed out at the beginning. You know, what are the measurements? What are the behaviors? You know, is there anything else in the environment that might go on? All of that should be talked about up front before you launch into a campaign and set yourself up for potential failure. Uh, Lisa, what about your thoughts? Um, how, how do you know if your program's working and, and what should you do if you figure out that it's not? So I'll resist the urge to tell uh, more stories about interns, but <laughs> well, we've all had security stories with interns. Um, I, so I agree with Joe. It's about monitoring the behavior that that you want to change, right? Um, and that's why phishing tools are so popular because you're at, you're you know monitoring. A, it's very specific, right? It's very focused. Um, I would say you know look beyond um, the security department, looking into the world of IT and R and D or um, metrics from around the business that you think you should be able to influence, um, you know, relative to their engagement with security. Like I gave the example earlier of, of training your software developers, right? Is there something about your program where you're trying to get more engagement with your R&D or your development community? And so, um, therefore, maybe your penetration test results should show a difference if you've if you've had success with that organization right and it might not be that you're specifically training them on how not to write security vulnerabilities it could be that you're just training them and doing outreach and trying to get engagement for your application security professionals to to work with them um uh to be more embedded with those development teams and things like that um so i think one of the other things I'll say is that people sometimes miss whenever you're going to sort of attack a particular problem area like that, um, always get a baseline. You can't go back and create a baseline. If you just jump in and start measuring and you don't know, you don't have that starting point, then it's really hard to say, well, this is how much I improve things, right? Mm -hmm. So that's really, really important. Um, the other thing I'd say is when you're presenting metrics out to your leadership, it's important to present the numbers, but people also want those um, anecdotes, right? Those stories, right? That's what sticks in executives' minds, not just the numbers that you got, but if you have a particular success story with an with a, with a individual or a group that you were working with, um, you got some, some specific feedback that was, that was um, of note, then add that, you know, not just quantitative results, but add those sort of qualitative results to your presentations and, and that, um, tends to stick in people's minds when you can present that information. All right. And uh, Kristen, any, anything from you as far as how to measure success? Well, I, I think I would just want to say um, metrics are hard. They're hard in the security awareness space. There's not a, you know, quick and dirty list like here's the metrics you should use. Um, they're hard to find, they're hard to measure. Um, I mean, if you have like a fish me type simulation program, those are easy, but I mean, you can even, you can cheat on those, right? You can, <laughs> if you're, if all you've been told is we need to get click rates down, I mean, you can just send out very, very similar fish one after the other, similar scenarios and people are going to get it you know it's the nigerian bank thing eventually people get it and they stop but that again compliant but not effective because they're not learning anything and you're not throwing different new scenarios at them um, that they're because in the case of fishing they're probably going to see all of these 
not only on their business email, but on their personal email as well. Um, so they are important, but I think, I think it's equally important to know that they're hard. And so if you're working on this space, and especially if you're new in this space and you're being asked to come up with a set of metrics and define them, it, it's, it's not simple, even for people who've been at it a long time. And a lot of times all you do have are anecdotal which can be effective and they can be helpful and help you improve your program. But sometimes the, the best stuff you have is anecdotal and stories versus hard numbers, but those can work as well. All right, um, cool. Let's get to uh, some questions from the audience. Now, one that keeps coming up a lot and is probably not a surprise to you guys is around repeat offenders. So Shimshi wants to know, how do you go about dealing with users that never learn, um, <laughs> continually endangering the company. Spectre 01101 wants to know, everyone has a Nancy in payroll who just never gets it despite our best attempts and tailored education. I think John Oliver says it's Susan from accounting, but yeah, we get your point. Um, how do we fix Nancy? Uh, Kristen, what, what are your thoughts? How do you deal with repeat offenders? Well, I mean, for specific instances, um, you know, we ran a program where we would fairly regularly penetration test passwords. I was saying, and, and you see terrible, awful, weak passwords. And then sometimes when you would retest, you know, you'd see that the person had gone from, you know, Corvette 18 to Corvette 19. Um, <laughs> so, so they're not getting it, right? Um, just people that do the iterative changes to, to their passwords. So, I mean, I think really that, you just educate, educate, educate. And then sometimes, I mean, I was at a conference years ago and an aerospace and defense representative was talking about her security awareness. And I mean, clearly the risk to the company is, is higher and more severe in an environment like that. But they had, you know, honestly, so many offenses and you're, you're let go because you're, you are a danger to the security and the risk environment of your company. So, I mean, I think that's an extreme and, and I think security people want to do that. <laughs> they want to go, you know, three bad passwords in a row, you're gone. Um, but I, I mean, really it is just, and, and, and making sure that when you're doing the training and the education and awareness, like we've been saying, you're, you're hitting it from different channels, different, different ways. And so maybe the article that you posted on your intranet didn't resonate with a certain group. But maybe, you know, a poster will or maybe a quick, funny video will. I mean, you just you kind of need to exhaust the list of ways you can try to reach people, um, because if you're just, you know, if Nancy just keeps doing dumb things and you keep sending her the same article, <laughs> it's there's likely not going to be a change. Yeah, I actually have a really strong opinion about that, about this one because you hear it so much and I've I've given it a lot of thought and I've talked to a couple of labor attorneys about it because you hear so many um, security professionals that get really frustrated and they just want to do the public hanging, right? They just want to do the off of their head. Um, <laughs> I think when you point the finger at somebody, there's always three fingers pointing back at you, right? The old, <laughs> the old saying. So I think you really have to take a really good look, like Kristen said, at what have you done to train this person? If they're not learning, is it them or is it you or is it a combination of both? It's probably a combination of both. So have you put um, content and training in front of them that's engaging? Do you understand enough about this person or this cohort or people to know what their learning styles are? Do you know what kind of articles they click on? Do you have data on what they find engaging, whether it was training modules or, or something you put on an employee portal or something you put in an email? Um, do you have the tools in place from corporate comms so that you can get data on what kind of content the people are engaging with so that you can, so that you know enough about their learning style and you can keep take, you know, pull them through the funnel in that way, right? At speaking their language, right? Then I think it's really important to have an escalation process in place. And this is something you have to do in advance with HR, right? So don't just kind of show up at the user's cubicle and sit on their desk and look down on them and, <laughs> and try and talk to them about phishing. Um, work with your leadership, work with uh, HR, whoever the folks are in your organization, so that you had, we had a three or four strike type rule where um, the first strike, okay, everybody gets a first strike, but after that, it might involve uh, you talking, meeting with the person individually, and then maybe after that, it would be you meeting with them along with their supervisor, um, and then after that, it would be you meeting with them and their supervisor and the representative from HR. 
Um, I think it's really important to put a lot of protections, technical protections around those people, right? So maybe they don't have admin rights to their laptop or their USB drive is disabled or whatever it is, right? If, if, if you're really struggling with their behavior. Um, and then I think after that, it's, it's, uh, I worked for a CISO used to say it's, it's not the security organization's job to fire anybody. It's HR's job to fire people. And I really think that's true. We really don't need to be seen as the heavy handed, you know, security police. We want to have a healthy relationship and engagement with our organizations. And we're not going to get that if, you know, when the security people talk to you 30 days later, you're out of a job, right? Like people aren't going to want to interact with us. So I think that um, what makes sense then, and, and you can ask some, you know, I've talked to a couple of labor attorneys who will say, like, if somebody fails a phishing um, exercise, you know, essentially you're failing somebody it, it, you would be trying to fire somebody for failing training nothing bad actually happened they just clicked on something um a, a phishing you know they clicked on a on a training exercise so would that really pass the sniff test with a, a lawyer that that would be real cause for termination i think that's that's legal's decision that's hr's decision that's not necessarily the security people's uh decision um i think what you do at that point like what's the security answer to to protecting your organization from that individual is the risk process, right? If, we're, if we've decided that we're going to keep this person, then um, just like you would have a risk assessment on anything else and the business signs off and, and, and decides that they're going to accept the risk, that's for that person's manager and their organization, their department to decide that, yes, we're, even though this person presents a risk to the organization, we've decided they're worth it because of XYZ. And so we're going to have these protections around them and we're going to do our best. But then that, that doesn't, that's, that's out of our hands, right? That becomes Hey, Lisa, you're starting to break up a little bit. Um, we're going to go to Joe next and, uh, mm -hmm. oh, wait, are you back? Try talking again. Nope, that's fine. Can okay. you hear me now? <laughs> yeah, we can hear you no, now. No, I just think uh, we, we have to stay in our swim lane. We're not HR. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and I, and uh, I think, I, yeah, Lisa really got to my point right there, uh, right towards the end, uh, which is, yeah, we're not we're not the police, right? And, and look, this really goes back to the size of the organization you represent. So in a smaller organization where the security team may have more authority and more, you know, are empowered to do more you can take different actions and you can as your organization gets very big. So the organization I was in was very, very big and everybody knew nobody was going to get fired for clicking on a phishing email, right? You know, that's just not going to happen. So you just have to understand that. And, and whether it's a small organization or a large organization, I think just getting together with your leadership, as Lisa said, but, and getting an understanding of what's your risk appetite, right? It's a foolhardy game to think that you're ever going to get click rates to zero or you're ever going to get reporting rates to hundred percent when it comes to phishing. That's not going to happen is not as long as human beings are on the planet, right? So what's our risk appetite? And I think somebody used the example of Nancy and payroll or, you know, this person or that person, you know, is it okay? Are we going to really build our program around chasing down one or two or a dozen or 200 people when everything else seems to be just fine? It, it, it really, it really depends upon what you're willing to accept. So, um, and I think Lisa was also touching on what we call getting it into the employee compliance framework, the HR function who would take, the action. I mean, it's small organization, medium or big organization. You could have that escalation path that says, listen, um, we have ample evidence that you've received this training. You're not getting it. That's OK. You know, I think there was an example made that, uh, you know, you might remove entitlements from that individual or there are certain things that you can or can't do because you're not getting it. That may mean you can't be in certain roles. And the organization I was in, when it got turned into that escalation path with HR, it became part of the review process. I saw a good comment here in the questions uh, from somebody that said, you know, they're starting to make this part of the review process. The review process would document this in your HR file, if you will, uh, that you've got this bad behavior, which could impact your rating. And in many firms, ratings could impact your compensation. So it's a veiled threat, but not one that I have to make from the security awareness side of the equation right but so i think that's kind of it you just have to understand the risk appetite the risk tolerance what leadership really expects you can change by way of behavior you're not going to bank your program on chasing down a few users that never get it but understand what that escalation path could be and yeah i agree i don't think it's really the job of the security team security awareness team to uh you know be dismissing anybody from the from the firm all right. Um, let's do a couple questions on pen testing real quick, because Kisten, you brought that up, and hopefully we can get knockies out of the way. Dave Gunther 
um, who, by the way, mentioned in chat that he thinks uh, Joe has a great head of hair. Uh, but Dave also <laughs> wanted to know what tool do you guys use for uh, password uh, penetration testing? I can't answer that because I don't know what our team used. Um, so <laughs> I just I just would get the results in the Excel spreadsheets and who I had to um, communicate with. But I'm sorry, I don't know what they used. I don't know if Joe or and I would be prohibited from telling you if I, if I actually knew. I think what I what would be good to know, maybe from Dave uh, or or uh, Lisa, you know, on the vendor side, what the interpretation is behind that question. Because I don't know that it's a tool specific answer that's really needed here. I mean, is there something lacking in the tool that's currently in use, or just looking for a best practice? But I mean, there's there are just so many good tools out there. I think you just have to understand what it, what it is. I'm not sure what Dave might be looking for. I do appreciate the comment about my hair. <laughs> but I, I can't be terribly helpful with the actual tool. <laughs> but I can tell you all about the hair product offline. So, <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, tech team also want to know how often do you guys recommend doing pen testing, and how long after training? Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Pen testing meaning fishing? Yeah, either fishing or like actually going through a service to like go through. You know, either you do your own fish testing or you hire outside, um, you know, red teams to, to try to get to your users. So I was working on a cadence where um, we were doing quarterly fishing to the entire organization. And then um, then I was doing spear fishing much, much, much more frequently because that's more, I think, what the real world looks like. Right. So. I had um, people classified into sort of high risk groups, right? You'd have accounts payable and, and people like that, the people that actually have access to money, um, bank accounts, being able to issue checks, all those things. Um, senior executives, admins as well, um, because they had, they had access and control of the senior executives email. So they were looking out for things. Um, so I, you know, developers, uh, the IT help desk people. Um, so I was going down the route of slicing and dicing the data from my general fishing of the whole population to see what roles, what physical locations, you know, we might have had a really high click rate in a particular role in India versus a, you know, a different click rate in a particular role in a, in a you know, maybe a R&D organization or a, I was uh, just, you have to let the data tell you, um, really dig into those results and figure out where your pockets are, where your, your opportunities are. They're not problems, they're opportunities for training. Um, and then and then doing spear phishing with, with those groups uh, to to raise the bar, right? I'm I'm not an advocate of I think Kristen said earlier, you can you can you know, you can jerry rig those results. You can just send out really easy fish and say, Look, our click rate went down and um, <laughs> you're you're not trying to just engineer numbers, you're trying to educate people. Um, let's go through one last question uh, from Angie. What's going on, Angie? Uh, she says, the reality is that some people just simply can't absorb or remember all the information in that amount of time. How do you deal with that? Um, Joe, let's start with you. Um, what are your thoughts as far as spacing um, and how to give people information without overloading them? There's overwhelming evidence that goes back to the you know Greeks. Uh, about how how to learn, right? So uh, yeah, space. You just mentioned spacing, right? You need repetition. You need spacing. You need t time to digest. All of that's important when constructing any type of program. But also, uh, over the last few years, there, there's been a growing a, a regrowth in this notion of performance support, right? So the the trainings, particularly if they're CBT or classroom based, they they tend to be events. What's What's probably more important is pointing people to the resources, having a place that somebody can go that hopefully is compelling and contains engaging material. That could be a corporate intranet site, a company homepage, a, a website, wherever it might be. But but it's important that they know that there's some place they can go back to, right? Because hours after the training event, certainly days after the training event, I'm lucky if I remember 10, 20, 25% of, of that material, right? So it's just Nobody can be expected to retain that without being able to go back, reflect on it, see it again. And then uh, we talked a lot about engagement today. So one of the last project I was, was working on was to change that site 
from just not just a place where you would go see a PDF document or a text-based file, but you know the the awareness team. We were now beginning to make those interactive, tutorial-based, gamified type things. So that would additionally help reinforce something that you may have heard in in an event or a, or a, an event-based training. But it's important that they know that there's some place they can go back to. There's some safe zone. There's some touchstone where I can go back and review that material long after I've taken some required training. Yeah, and hopefully you're teaching here. stuff in a way that you're going for muscle memory, right? You're trying to create habits in people, new habits in people. So hopefully you're, you're training to that as opposed to information overload and people feel like they just have to remember it all the time, right? You're trying to actually create, create new habits in folks. All right, guys, we are, we're starting to run out of time. I did want to give you guys one last opportunity to uh, share any final thoughts or advice. Uh, Lisa, we'll stay with you. Uh, any final takeaways that you'd like the audience to walk away with today? Um, I think I saw somebody ask a question in chat about, um, you know, what do you, what do you, what's your first step after um, you start fishing and, and you've got a high click rate? I would say even though there's so much stuff that has to be done, you know, to start to kick your fishing program off, whitelisting and, and, you know, hopefully installing a, a reporting button, all those things, that once you've sent that first baseline fish, that's when your job really starts that's when it gets good, right? That's when you need to um, really dig into the whole idea of educating people and creating engagement with your security organization. So um, so I know a lot of folks get, it is kind of fun. <laughs> it's, I used to say I had an evil twin that ran the phishing program, um, but that's, that's, uh, that's just one tool in your tool belt. And um, actually seeing people learn and seeing people engage and, and getting more demand for your security services across your security team, having more people walk up to their cube and ask them questions, all those things, that's what should really be getting you excited just as much as, as your evil twin who sends out fish. <laughs> all right, Joe, any, any final words of wisdom from you? Final thoughts. I, I think I have uh, uh, two quick ones, if I, if I may. So I, I think it's important to understand the culture that you have or maybe more importantly, the culture that you aspire to be, because that will define the behaviors, right? That's what drives the culture. And in a security awareness program is the last piece, right? We, then we do what we need to do to alter, change, or support those behaviors. So a quick example is like what I like to call a gotcha culture, right? They may define click rates as the most important thing. A secure aware culture may say reporting, is the more important metric. You got to define what you want to be and hopefully leadership supports you on that. Uh, secondly is uh, we talked so much about engagement. Look, engagement is going to happen in, in many, many ways, but it's more likely to happen and more likely to stick if it's fun and if it's relevant, right? We talked about that at the top. And look, if you're, if you're working in a culture that prohibits fun, we're probably going to have to talk to you <laughs> offline about some ideas you can use there. Lisa uses a word that I love, which is it empowers an organization through education. I think that's that's the phrase I, I, I love. And Kristen, any uh, final takeaways from you? Yeah, I think interestingly, the last question that came through is a good question, but it's, a, it's basically also a justification for your program because you can't expect people to take a 30 minute hour long training course once a year and remember it and change their behaviors because of it. So that's the whole point of your program. Um, and hopefully, you know, a lot of the really key critical things that you want people to learn and know are part of that training, but then your program spends the other, you know, 51 weeks of the year just reminding them what that was. And like we said, through different channels and different ways of presenting it. So. So people have all kinds of different ways to learn and retain that information. And also when you're including the why for that information, they understand why it's important for their behavior to change so that they're doing a better job of protecting the systems and the information and things at the company. And also, like we always say, if you can, if you can bring it to the personal side as well, it's even more impactful if you can tell them you know, why that matters on their home PC or on their kid's phone or something. It's all, you're, you're just doing messaging, messaging, messaging all year, different messages, different channels, because absolutely they are not going to remember that one hour of training <laughs> for the rest of the year. Not a chance. 
All right. Well, guys, it is now time to announce the winner of our prize. So the winners of the two FLIR uh, spot thermal cameras are going to go to Paplu the Pirate and M. Southworth. So congratulations, Paplu and M. Southworth. You guys are the winners of our FLIR thermal cameras. Um, send a private message to Matt Y in the community. Let him know where you would like that shipped. Uh, and let us know how you guys like them. A uh, big thank you to all of our panelists. Again, Joe, Kristen, and Lisa. And in fact, got a shout out from Angie with all this attention on Joe's hair. Let's not leave the lovely ladies out. Thank you for being on the show and sharing your knowledge. <laughs> Um, awesome. Thank you to InfoSec as well for um, sponsoring today's event. Uh, if you guys want to see more events just like we saw today, make sure to click on that orange widget that says click here for upcoming shows, or just stick around until after the presentation ends and check out all the other stuff that we've got coming up just like what you saw today. And until then, guys, stay safe and keep it spicy, and we will see you all back here next time. Take care, everybody.